I'd like to share with you from Hebrews chapter 11, starting in verse 8. By faith Abraham, when called to go to a place that he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city whose, with foundation, whose architect and builder is God. By faith Abraham, even though he was past age, and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become a father because he considered him, who, him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one person, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. We're looking today once again at faith and hope. Faith enables us to see beyond the present to the eternal hope that we have in God, in Jesus. Abraham and Sarah, in their old age, are called by God, and so they start out on the greatest, most challenging journey of their entire lives. Abraham and Sarah are willing to follow God, even blindly, to go where no one from their city has ever gone before. Have you ever been asked to do something by God that you couldn't understand. A minister was talking to his wife one day and he said, honey, have you ever, or can you ever think of a time when God told you to do something and it didn't make sense, but you did it anyway? Oh yes, she responded, when God told me to marry you. Faith is obeying God, even when we don't understand it. Billy Graham tells the story of a friend of his who during the Depression had lost his job, his fortune, his family. But he held tenaciously to his faith, the only thing he had left. One day as he was walking along, he stopped to watch some men who were doing stonework on a huge church building. One of them was chiseling a large triangular piece. He went up to him and he asked, what are you going to do with that piece? The workman stopped and looked at me and said, you see that little opening way up there near the spire? Well, I am shaping this down here so it will fit in up there. Tears filled the man's eyes as he walked away. God had spoken to him through this workman to explain his ordeal. I am shaping you down here so you'll fit in up there. Christian life is a life of hope. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1 it says, Faith means that we are certain of the things we hope for, convinced of the things we do not see. This pandemic is like for many a terrible storm which is causing not only financial problems, but emotional problems as well. And storms can erode our confidence, our faith, our hope in God. This can be a very challenging time for a lot of people. One person stated this, I like this. He said, this is easier for introverts because we are comfortable not going out. We are comfortable not connecting with people. However, this is a very challenging time for, for extroverts because they need to do the very thing they're told not to do, and that is to connect. So it's a very challenging time emotionally for them. The British government a number of years ago considered isolation and loneliness so detrimental to emotional well-being that they appointed a minister for loneliness. So here's some thoughts to think about as we go through this time together. First, listen to other people. How are they feeling? 
recognize and acknowledge the uniqueness of how they're feeling about the situation. Because each one of us is different and the way we deal with things is unique. Then acknowledge and validate how this may be impacting them, how challenging this may be for them, as well as for yourself. Try to take things on a day-by-day -day basis, on a moment-by-moment -moment basis even. Don't think too far ahead. And, and notice what you're feeling and how it impacts your responses, your reactions. And then trust God in the storm. In the early days of the persecuted church, a humble Christian was brought before the Roman judges. He told them nothing they could do could shake him because he believed if he was faithful to God, God would be faithful to him. The judge looked down on him and he said, do you really think God is interested in the likes of you? I not only think so, said the man, I know it. I know it. John Bunyan. Now let's not mistake John Bunyan for Paul Bunyan. Paul Bunyan and Babe, that's the legend down in the United States. But John Bunyan was a Puritan preacher and author who lived in the 1600s. John wrote almost 60 books. And one book that he wrote, a number of people would know this one here, is called The Pilgrim's progress. Here's some quotes from John Bunyan. You have not lived today until you have done something for someone who can never repay you. It is better, in prayer, it is better to have a heart without words than words without a heart. And what God says is best, is best though all people in the world are against it. At one time in the life of John Bunyan, he was struggling with serious doubts about the Bible. In his mind, he was saying, everybody thinks that they are right in their own belief. And so what if the Bible is only a, an I think so book? But as he thought and as he prayed and as he struggled, Finally, faith broke through, and John stood up and shouted, I know, I know it is true. I know God loves me. So faith is looking forward with complete conviction. Faith means we are certain of the things we hope for, that God has purpose and plan, and he will accomplish it. Faith is not wishful thinking. It's not, I hope so, I think so. Faith is, I know. Our faith in Jesus is a certainty. Hope and faith in Jesus dictates our conduct. We live and die by our hope. John Bunyan, again, started his ministry as a very poor person. His father was a tinker, and he became a tinker as well, too. A tinker is a person who travels from place to place fixing metal utensils. When John and his first wife were married, the only things that they had were two books. As he stated, we did not have a spoon or a plate between the two of us. His first wife passed away eight years later, leaving John with four children to raise. Now, back in those days, Puritans were not well accepted in England. Neither were Congregationalists, for that matter. Twice, during the time of religious intolerance, John was imprisoned for preaching. Before his trial, John stated this, I begged God for freedom rather than prison, but if not, God's will be done. God's will be done. Hope in Jesus dictates our conduct. The words of John echoed the words of Jesus. 
when Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said these words, and we find them in Mark chapter 14 and verse 36. And he was saying, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not as I will, but what you will. Our hope enables us to stand against the world. King Nebuchadnezzar was the greatest warrior king of ancient Babylon. And in the book of Daniel, and in chapter 2, we see that the king had had a disturbing dream. And Daniel, through God, interpreted this dream for the king. And the king was impressed, and he elevated Daniel to a very high position in the country. And in part of the interpretation of the dream, Daniel tells the king this, your majesty, you are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. God has given you all of these things. Now some 20 years later, in an act of defiance, the king sets up a 90 foot tall statue of himself built of gold. Doing this was a, like a declaration that his kingdom, the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar, would last forever. There would be no kingdom of silver or bronze or iron as the dream had revealed, as God had revealed. Then he, the king, ordered that all would bow down to his image, showing loyalty to him and not to God, choosing life over being thrown into a fiery furnace. Yet without hesitation, the three friends of Daniel chose loyalty to God and death. Our hope enables us to stand up against the world. If you're wondering about the story, you can read it in Daniel chapter 3, and you'll find the wonderful outcome of the story in Daniel chapter 3. Jim Reeves sang this song once. It's called, I'd Rather Have Jesus. Let me share a few words of this song with you. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches unfold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or land. Yes, I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hand than to be the king of a best domain and be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. I'd rather have Jesus than man's applause. I'd rather be faithful to his dear cause. I'd rather have Jesus than worldwide fame. I'd rather be true his holy name. These words were written by Ray F. Miller in 1922. Now Mrs. Beverly Shaw, or Shay, put these words on their home piano in hopes that her son George would find them, read them, and that it would change the direction of his life. And it worked. George read the words and was inspired not only to composed the music, but also he was inspired to change the direction of his life. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 13, it says, it's talking about the people in the Old Testament, the people of faith in the Old Testament times. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were strangers and foreigners on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. And if they've been thinking about the country they had left, they would have had an opportunity to return. Instead, they were looking for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God for he has prepared a city for them. Remember that story of the man? As he realized God was shaping him down here so that he could fit in up there. I'd like to share this story with you in closing. 
there was a young girl who was blind from birth. When she was 12, the doctors were able to perform a new type of surgery that, if successful, would give her the gift of sight. The outcome would not be known for several days. After the bandages had been removed, her eyes had to be protected from the light, and so she sat in darkness, waiting. Her mother spent long hours answering her daughter's questions about what things looked like and what she would expect. They were both so excited about the possibility of being able to see that neither slept very much. Over and over, even in the darkness, they talked about each lovely thing they could imagine, about colors and shapes and beauty of every kind. Finally, the moment came when the young girl's eyes could endure enough, enough light for her to look out the window. And so the curtains were pulled back, and she stood for a long while without saying a single word. Outside, the spring day was ideal, bright and warm with fluffy clouds decorating the blue sky. Blossoms sprinkling to the ground like pink snow, yellow flowers lined the walkway through the grass. When the girl turned back to her mother, tears were streaming down her cheeks. Oh, mother, why didn't you tell me it would be so beautiful? Right now, we may feel as if we're sitting in darkness, going by faith alone, wondering and hoping, praying and asking God for help and trusting, sometimes doubting, but still trusting. But before long, we too will be asking God the same question. Why didn't you tell me it was so beautiful? All that awaits us. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for the gift of faith that you give us, a faith that will help us to endure the storms that come our way. Give us eyes of faith to see the impossible. Give us a faith that will hold on and Help us to remain faithful and to be able to repeat those words, I know, I know it's true. I know, I know God loves me. Bless us, I pray, in Jesus' name.